Hello everyone, the following video is especially for all the new people in the plug and script group who are curious about the new update on plug and script called plug and script 3 and um, you might ask yourself still if you should become a VST developer and if you are a little bit like me um, and you come from the realms of musicians then you might really wonder if you can get started in a new uh, way, in a new world in which um, creativity is not that important anymore but more like math and stuff. First of all I think that's a myth and um, actually you do need some math but you still have to be very creative to come up with effects and especially if you are not very good at math um, you have to come up with good alternative ways to solve problems and that requires uh, creativity and that's why you should totally come and um, try at least and in order to encourage you to um, do that I made a little uh, reverb plug-in that will show you that it's not too hard to understand even though a reverb isn't the easiest plug-in ever. Uh, I think I made a pretty simple one. First of all let me show you how it sounds. So yeah, it's a little reverb. Maybe the gain knobs are not very interesting, but they are the easiest. Also the mix knob is very easy. A little bit com more complicated is the filter section with the um, low, low pass, high pass button and the filter cutoff knob that dials in the amount of filtering. And the hardest part of everything is probably the room size, but this is also the one that sounds the best. So let's just start talking about what's going on there. I have to pull over my code to the actual screen that is being recorded. Now let's see how does it work in plug and script. If you are new to plug and script then um, you came to the right place because I will uh, explain everything from the beginning. First of all, the plugin has a name in the description, but I never change that. Then I include an HDLHXX file. If you look at the path, um, then you see then that this um, file is called mainCXX, the main uh, script file, and there's another script file in here called HDL.HXX. Uh, so with this line we import the stuff from this script. Then we um, add all our parameters and give them names. One of the parameter also has an enum, uh, which in this case means that it has a little display that says what's currently the state of the button. And um, as you have seen a button looks different than a knob since it's a button and it also behaves different and uh, it's very easy to do that in plug and script you just have to in the input parameter steps just have to give it um, this the amount of steps called 2 because it has two steps it can either be 0 or 1 um, and it's this one and this one uh, it has a range between min and max 0 to 1 so you see that's how you make a button in plug and script really easy 
Well, once you have seen it, of course, you can't just come up with it yourself. Um, <clears throat> this is the method that we use to um, give things uh, the values from our input parameters. And this is in a so-called array. And when you get a value from a from an array, you uh, say the array's name, and then you take these kind of brackets and say the number that represents it. For example, this is the first entry of the array, the in gain. So that's why I say zero in here, and I put that into my in gain variable. And as you have seen. The in-gain variable is a float variable, which means that it can have decimal points. So it's not just uh, 0, 1, 2 and so on. It can also be 1.5 or something. And you see this is the case for the in-gain, the mix and the out-gain. In-gain, mix, out-gain. And you, you can also see that this is the simplest stuff from all the input parameters because it's just like take this value and put it in there while the other things are a little bit different more about that later so um, then you see the gain is used in this method because this is the method that actually changes the sound the sound comes from this object from the object called data however uh, it also holds some other information so you are not confused why it's used so many times here uh, <coughs> however in gain is just used here we multiply in gain with um, the method that gets our reverb data um, and that's why this is the input gain and um, this whole statement is being multiplied with output gain and that's why this is the output gain and mix is being used in this function call and the function call is called mix but the parameter is also called mix but they are different kind of mixes um, I guess I have to explain it later too because it's not the main part of this effect however maybe I just start like that I decided for a size of the reverb that's needed because a reverb can have um, wait up I have to close the window I guess <sighs> okay so a reverb is often a combination of delays and every delay needs a size because we are working with samples. Every sample is like an audio pixel, so to say. And um, we have to save all these samples in a buffer when we make, an, make a delay. I will show that very soon. And that's why we have to decide for a size. This is the maximum size of the buffer and therefore the, uh, the longest delay time that's possible with a delay and I decided to use sample rate divided by 12 what does the sample rate have to do with that you might ask you only know sample rate because it has something to do with oversampling in distortion plugins but actually sample rate is being used in almost all DSP modules because it's a good way to measure time because when you Google sample rate and look on Wikipedia, you find out sample rate is defined by samples per second. So if you want to express anything that has to do with a second, then you just say sample rate. So this is a twelfth of a second, basically. That's the maximum time for one repetition of the delays in the reverb. Then there is an object called reverb, HDL reverb. How does that work? Um, that, that works because everything in this uh, other file in the HDL 
.xxx file is part of the namespace hdl. A namespace is kind of an area that, that you can just define and everything, every object in it uh, can only be instantiated by saying the name of the namespace before and that's useful for if you have different namespaces then you can just um, give them different meanings the functions you can have two functions with the same name but in different namespaces which makes sense if you have different topics in your code so to say I don't have different topics but I still put everything into my HDL namespace just so when we hang out in in the other parts of the code we can see which of the stuff is written by me basically <coughs> then okay this is a an object of type reverb that makes sense because I have a class here that's called reverb whenever you have a class of something you can make an object of that and the reverb class <coughs> it asks for a size this is meant size and um, that's why I give it a size and a default feedback value. I don't need the default feedback value anymore because we have a feedback parameter here. But for my experiments I actually had a fixed feedback um, for a while. So that's all you have to do to instantiate the reverb. <coughs> and now all these methods down here also make sense. Um, we can set the room size, set the feedback, set the filter type and the filter cutoff and as you can see when, when you open the class reverb then you see these are actually methods of the part of the reverb class and that's how you give your DSP modules um, the possibility to uh, <coughs> yeah to do something when a parameter moves you just write functions like this. Um, one little thing, the filter type has a function call here called rint. This is an important function if you use buttons. It will take the input parameter value which is not an integer and make that an integer. And that's useful because um <coughs> otherwise it can happen that the last value of the maximum value cannot be reached then. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. Um, and that's bad. So whenever you have um, a parameter that should go in steps and works a little bit like this, then you must use rint and rint this function. <coughs> okay, I think this is pretty clear. We have the input parameters now for all of the uh, things. Now what's going on in process block? Um, again, this is the method that processes the sample data. First of all, it gets the block data, the object data. This is a thing from plug and script and it has uh, a lot of values, uh, a lot of information. I mean, it has information about the transport um, of the plugin, for example, the BPM or the current, current project position and stuff. You have to look into the manual to, to see it but it also has some more essential stuff like how many samples does the current buffer have that is being sent to the plugin by the host and how many outputs does the current track have the um, plugin is on. So we can loop through these um, aspects of sound. You, we can loop through all the samples and we can loop through all the channels and inside of this this uh, double loop we can do our audio processing and this is the thing that holds the sample from um, from from uh, I mean the current sample from the buffer yes with the channel and the sample we are currently at and um, I have made this little function uh, this little helper function here because we use that a lot it's uh, called mix because it's used to mix the values a and b by the amount of p and p is a number between 0 and 1 so 
if this is zero then you get a and if this is one then you get b this just mixes the things very easy and that's why i use it here for the mix knob as you can see the function wants three arguments so we have to give it three numbers separated by a commata so i say hdl mix and this is the first number the just the dry sample without anything and the second one is um, my process function from the reverb with the sample and the channel data and in gain and then this is just mixed by the mix value now you already know how a mix parameter works which is pretty cool because as you have seen it's pretty easy and you can use that in a lot of plugins almost every plugin benefits from a mix knob in my opinion now I have to uh, go to the door and let my cat in My cat is really cute and I am also really cute. Okay, so now let's go, let's look at the reverb. Now that we covered everything that is in the main um, method, now it's getting interesting. So now we have our reverb in here. When it gets instantiated, it gets resized and it gets set some default feedback. As I've already said, this is not really needed. So this is also not needed, but let's look at the resize. The resize method actually resizes a lot of delays. These are delays. So it just takes this value that it got from here and it uh, moves it onto the delays. It doesn't do anything else in the reverb class itself. I know this looks a little bit wonky if you have been a programmer before. But as far as I know, AngelScript does not have the option to let custom classes and objects of cl custom classes be put in an, in an array maybe they improved that by now i i hope so at least because this looks like shit and this could be solved with a for loop much more beautifully um, but yeah since i don't know if that works i just write them down here so as if as you can see this is a, an, another object that i made uh, feedback delay stereo and as you've seen this time I don't have to say HDL um, in front of it like this because now we are inside of HDL so we don't have to clarify that and when I say private before an object then that just means that it can't be um, um, you can't look at it from somewhere outside of the class um, you can, for example, go here and say reverb point and then just talk to the delay that is inside. This will not work because the delay is private and this part of the code does not know about the delays. It just knows about the reverb. That has no meaning for the code itself, but it's uh, good to write code like that because then you show other programmers who look at your code that this is not meant to be seen from other parts of the code. And th therefore it doesn't matter from other parts of the code. Um, yeah. So set filter cut off works the same, just the, the difference is that it um, sets the cutoff of the different filters. There are two filters, one for the left and one for the right channel. And of course, if you use the plugin on the mono track, then it will just only use the left channel. Now, filter type works the same way. It uh, just sets the type on the filter. And we will see very soon what that means. The room size is actually um, a delay. So we set the delay of the delays, um, the delay length to the value that is being given by the parameter. And then the other delays uh, get other values. And I decided spontaneously to use the Fibonacci sequence for that because I thought that's kind of beautiful. 
and yeah that was just a spontaneous idea but as you've heard it sounds pretty good so uh, that's nice and as you've as you, as you can see the delay asks for two arguments um, that's for the left channel and for the right channel and by giving it different arguments for both channels I get a, f a reverb that actually adds something to the stereo width of the um, sound then the feedback also works like that but the other way around but also the Fibonacci sequence and m with minus values every once in a while uh, also very spontaneously decided for that this has no meaning and that's what I meant with creative work you can just do something like this and just um, try if it sounds good and if it doesn't then yeah whatever and try something else um, so now this is the process method what it does is first of all it checks which channel we are on currently because the channel is one of the arguments that is being um, used and if it's the first channel then uh, process the left filter and else process the right filter and um, process the sample with it replace the sample with a processed sample that's how we filter stuff and then we return um, an, an, a little sum of all the delays process but we multiply that with point one to five which is the same as divided by eight maybe this makes it more clear the thing is we have eight delays so if we don't divide by eight then this is getting very loud so we divide it by eight at the end <coughs> yeah so this is also pretty straightforward and that's basically all the reverb does there are a lot of reverb designs that work much more complexly for example by um, also utilizing other kind of delays these are just feedback delays but what you often see in reverbs is all pass filters but I was too lazy to incorporate all pass filters in this little demo and I also wanted to keep it simple so this is just um, a lot of delays working in parallel and then divide by 8 and then give that back you see this is not a void function but a double function and since I'm at it and uh, explain everything in detail I can say that when the data type of a function is being put at the beginning of it then it means that you have to return a value that ha is f of this data type and that's the case for these processes and um, we we see this is the uh, the place where we use this so we get this number here from the method and then we multiply that with the in gain and that's it okay one other thing that you might have asked yourself because you have probably seen that already is what's the difference between this this and this well this is an integer uh, a whole number this is a double value um, a value with decimals that is very that ha can have very many zeros behind the dot and the float um, value is one that has only a few dots it is very unprecise but oftentimes good enough but since samples are being stored as double values anyway I decided to return double here okay so now you understand how the reverb works this is basically how the reverb works very easy isn't it now you might want to ask yourself um, how does the filter work this is the simplest filter that you can find on the whole internet it's a, si a filter that can be a low pass filter or a high pass filter I made this little enum which makes it clear and you can see I can make it even clearer by saying low pass is zero because that means that high pass must be one 
but I didn't have to clarify that because the first entry is always zero by default. So there is an enum called filter type which uh, declares zero as low pass and one as high pass. The filter actually has an integer called type and as you can see you can just say equals filter type low pass and then it will be zero. And when you set the type then it also expects a value between zero and one so it will put that into the type object and when you set the cutoff it works just the same it's just putting the value directly in it and that's it now what does the process do it gets the sample and it returns a sample if everything doesn't work then it just returns zero in order to show oh this has to be this kind of zero then it will return zero to show you that something didn't work. Now, um, if the type is filter type low pass, then we will return. We will first of all we will take the envelope and replace it with a mix between envelope, sample, and a very complex um, statement. Actually, we could simplify this a lot. Oh. Fuck, how did I do that? Ah, it works again. Okay. We could just do this. And it would work pretty fine. N just now that now the, it would be the case that the cutoff is actually turned around um, so that zero means maximum uh, cutoff and one means minimum cutoff so we turn that around by saying one minus cutoff and now it's the other way around and then I use this wave shaper called 10H um, to shape the parameter in a way that it feels a little bit better because sometimes the range of a parameter is not supposed to be linear to work very fine and then, and in the end I just came up with this and that's the same story for this line here um, and then I for a low pass filter I just return the envelope and for a high pass filter I return sample minus envelope you don't actually have to understand why this makes a low pass filter or a high pass filter you can try for yourself an experiment with it and then you will probably see why it does that but maybe not I found this by experimentation so it's okay if you don't get it so now let's go on we have the forced the feedback delay and the feed forward delay that I ended up not even using but we could use it for pre-delay function or something I will start with the feed forward delay because it's the most easy kind of delay it, ha it just has a buffer it has a delay value a read index and a write index when we make a new object of F for, uh, of a feed forward delay then in the constructor we will set the right index to zero we will resize it to the correct size the buffer will be resized and we set the delay to zero yeah um, just so we have some standard values now when we process everything there are three things happening first of all ink secondly the buffer gets the current sample at the place where the write index is and thirdly we return the result of get sample interpolated linearly so what does that mean let's start with ink ink just uh, says go one up with write index and that clarifies that write index will not be on the same value for the next sample it will always move one sample forward at some point write index will reach 
the end of the buffer and that's why we have this little line here which says when the right index reaches the buffer length then let it go back to zero that's what this line th says and uh, because that's the modulo op operator that that's just what the modulo operator does and um, that's and that's the reason why this will never be out of bounds then the read index however is always the write index minus the delay because the read index is the distance between the write index and the delay value um, and this has to be a new value for each new write index of course since the write index also moves on and um, of course when we say this minus this then can easily go below zero so we have to say if it goes below zero then better go up again and um, that's basically it that's the way that we make the read index always uh, stay inside of the bounds and then the method gets sample interpolated linearly well that's just linear interpolation because as you have seen the um, read index is a float value so it can be on an uneven number but what would it mean to say I want the sample at the place 2.5 or 2.7 what would that mean because you can always just say I want sample number one sample number two sample number three but you can just get the sample from number two and from number three and maybe you have number 2.7 so you just take a little bit more of number three than of number two and that's how we do it we say we want the integer value from our index so for 2.7 this would be 2 then we want the ceiling which would be 2 plus 1 is 3 and we have to take care to bounce it back to 0 just in case that this actually reaches the end of the buffer and then our frag is the um, normal index minus its floor so this is just the leftover stuff which in in the case 2.7 which be uh, would be 0.7 and then we can just use the mix formula that I made in the beginning and now you see why I made this up here so I can reuse it all the time yeah and that's the value that we get back and this is a very interesting topic there there are a lot of different ways to interpolate and I didn't come up with a lot of them yet but this is um, a pretty solid one for most cases um, and I know this is not good enough for a lot of people who are already b a little, little bit better in programming and everything but I think that this is already a thousand times better than not interpolating at all because you can also just say If you're really cheap you can just do this and it, it will work somehow it's just you just um, completely ignore the fact that this is a, f a float value then and it works but it just doesn't sound very nice and it can create aliasing in some cases I think it, do it doesn't create aliasing in this case but there are a lot of DSP algorithms where it does and then you have to re be really careful about not interpolating but this interpolation already brings you very far compared to not interpolating at all and it doesn't cost so much on the CPU so it's cool okay this is the feed forward delay and one thing that I want to stress here is we put a sample into the buffer and then we just return another sample but without the current sample and that's uh, exactly what feed forward means it won't give you back the current sample just the sample that already has been gone so this will create a sound uh, that um, that just gives you the sound that should have already happened but the sound that currently goes into the effect becomes silent this is the exact definition of a pre-delay in a reverb so if you wanted to add the pre-delay it would be a feed forward delay 
but I don't want to do that now. Now the feedback delay works correct, uh, completely the same, but the difference is that um, in the process method it doesn't just put the current sample into the buffer, but it also also puts the current buffer into the buffer again, but um, together with the sample and multiplied by the feedback value, a new value that we have down here, a new parameter. And also I wrapped it around a wave shaper because it sounded cool. And as I've seen it, uh, said in this comment, it's not very needed, but it's just so it sounds like a little bit more like a tape delay then. So that's cool. And also this makes the values, it keeps the values from getting over one because if you look at the function, then you see this will um, never go over one. Even if you put a number like this in here, it will uh, look pretty drastic, but never go over one. However, if you don't do that, then your value can go up into infinity. Um, and that happens very fast in a delay with feedback, because you always add up the last sample uh, more and more, and it gets worse and worse if you don't do anything about it. So this is a very easy way to tackle this problem. And then you just uh, give it back the value and that's it. So what are these other functions? As I've said earlier, there is no array for custom objects in um, plug in in angel script. So what I do to compensate for that is making stereo versions of the objects and they work like this, they just have uh, two instances of the object, also a smooth parameter object that I will go to soon, and then it processes, um, depending on the input channel, it processes the one or the other object. Yeah, that's also very easy to understand and it just passes on the parameter values that is being given to it from the reverb object. So you see at this point this or this lo already looks a lot like the reverb object but not yet and it's kind of building up on each other. Now what smooth parameter? As you have probably noticed when I move the room size knob it sounds smooth. And maybe you have not noticed that because it's uh, it sounds like a given. You won't expect um, a delay thing to not be smooth. But actually, if you don't smoothen the parameter, then it will not be smooth. Because what is this doing? It is saying we want the read index to have a distance from the right index of 2750 or 900. Now what happens if you play back some audio and you just do this very very fast. Go from zero to something else. Then it must go there, right? It must move over to here. But if you don't actively declare this to be a movement, then it will just jump there. And then it will sound very crackly and not very nice. So you actually have to make a little class that makes sure that the delay value is being smoothed out before it is being sent to the delay. And that's what the smooth parameter is doing. It basically starts with the destination and the parameter of zero and the retune speed that is very low. I never changed the retune speed in this program, but I give you the option to, to do that to experiment with different retune speeds or maybe make the retune speed a parameter if you want to. And then the process is very simple. We just mix the current parameter with the destination um, by the speed of the retune speed and then we return the parameter. 
And um, now let's see how this move parameter is being used. Now for every sample we um, say the parameter um, left side or right side should be processed and if you, as you've seen that means that we will get a value that uh, moves the parameter towards the destination by the speed of the retune speed. So that's the value that we will get here and then we put that into the delay in the corresponding delay. So actually set delay here up here does not set the delay of the delay object but of the parameter. It just sets the destination of the parameter. So that the actual delay value can be determined in this uh, method down here. Because this is the method that goes through the sample loop. And we don't we shouldn't forget about that. So that's the reason why the smooth parameter uh, is so smooth and we can just for fun try what happens if we add another zero to the retune speed thus making it a lot slower. Now it takes ages to reach the new speed. At some point we don't even know if it's still moving. It's also pretty cool, but I like it a little bit more fast. <laughs> Now what happens if we are really fast, like this? Now you already hear the crackles that I was talking about. And of course if we set the retune speed to 1, then that's basically the equivalent of not even smoothing out the parameter at all. And it would sound like this. Actually that's not too bad, you can't even hear the crackles because there are so many delays. I wouldn't have expected that. But still, having a smoothed out parameter sounds much better. Maybe we can make it slightly slower. Okay, so this was probably a lot for a beginner. I I won't pretend like this was very easy. Really, this is not that easy. But I must emphasize that I'm only programming since like a year or two or something. And I'm already so far that I can make reverbs that sound more or less pleasing if you like metallic reverbs <laughs> but I mean it's really <coughs> not that bad and this is just 250 lines of code so if you actually know what you're doing you can write full-on plugins in plugin script um, with less than 300 lines of code and with a lot of different parameters that have a useful function different DSP modules like filters and smoothed out parameters and stuff and even some stuff that is not even used yet yeah 
So actually this is pretty cool. And as I always um, say, you can really use this as um, as a plugin that you want to release for money because the audio performance actually fucked up as shit. Actually, when you play it back, it's, it's a little bit better. But still, you can enjoy that when it just goes up all the time. So this is not a plugin that you use to release your own plugins. But this is a plugin that you use to learn how to program plugins. And you can use this knowledge and take it everywhere you want. And that's just really cool. You can jump in, hit the button for making a new script, just start writing and with less than 300 lines come up with something that sounds cool. Yes. <laughs> 